Welcome back, mateys, mates, everybody in between. <laughs> uh, it's time for this ignorant American to learn. The animated history of Australia. You know, I'm, a, I'm American. History is just like boring to me. You know, I need it to be animated for me to pay attention. That So maybe I'll learn something here. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first 500 viewers who sign up using... Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Macrobius believed that there was far too much land in the Northern Hemisphere, and that there must be some undiscovered continent balancing the globe somewhere in the south. Okay, so the logic was a little flawed, but during the Age of Discovery, the search was on for Terra Australis Incognito. Fast forward a few centuries to the East Indies. Three Dutch sailors landed in Australia accidentally in the 1600s. The mythical Southern continent had just been found. It's pretty impressive, I must say. The fact that they didn't have, you know, MapQuest. I don't even know if you guys know what MapQuest is. But uh, the fact that they don't have, like, technology and they're even able to realize where they are in the ocean. I mean, I realize it is just, like, uh, relatively simple mathematics as far as using a compass and measuring how far you've gone and stuff with the, with the stars and stuff. But it's still uh, pretty crazy to me. Like, that they would even be able to know that they found a new land. Does that make sense? It's also just really crazy how long people lived on boats back then. These people, like, going exploring. What is all this? Is there this much battling in Australian history? Australia was the last of the new world to be discovered, because let's be honest, hmm. nobody cares about Antarctica. Australia was of course already inhabited. Indigenous Australians, also known as Aborigines, had a population of between 300 and 700,000 by modern estimates. I wanna know how they got there. Early contacts with these tribes were as often peaceful as they were violent. It is thought that these groups arrived in two stages. The first was from the Indian subcontinent via a land bridge that connected Australia to the island of New Guinea, bringing with them the Pama Nyuangan language family. The second wave was much later and may have been groups related to the Austronesians of Indonesia. Their culture and history was preserved through the oral tradition. The Dutch named the island New Holland after the county of Holland in the Netherlands. But it wasn't until the British landed on the east coast and named it New South Wales that Europeans began to settle. Landing what a horrible name. In Port Jackson on the 26th of January 1788. Sometimes I think that about New York. Maybe if it maybe if it had always been New Holland, I wouldn't think of it as being so dumb or New South Wales, but it just sounds dumb. Hey, that's today. The so-called First Fleet arrived to found the colony of Sydney, with the intention of using the labour of prisoners to achieve wealth for Britain. However, contrary to Australia's convict founding myth, less than half of this First Fleet were actually convicts. In the 1800s, Australia was circumnavigated, mapped, and new colonies started springing up all over. Hobart, Newcastle, Launceston, Port Macquarie, Brisbane, and Melbourne, with dozens of penal centres. Adelaide and Perth were founded as free settlement cities, but the latter was made into a penal colony after it failed to grow naturally. As the Europeans expanded, the frontier wars began with the Aboriginals, many of whom were hostile to the foreign invaders. Most Fair famously, enough. the Black War of Tasmania, which nearly wiped out the indigenous Tasmanians. But far more destructive to the Aboriginals was smallpox, which killed tens of thousands. Mm. Australia's growth would stagnate until the 1850s gold rush, which drew hundreds and thousands of settlers from all around the world in search for wealth, particularly in New South Wales and what would become Victoria. This would forever change Australia's character, with new free settlers overshadowing its convict past, bringing with them their ideas of European enlightenment, the American self-determinism, and the Chinese hatred for the British? <laughs> These gold diggers became discontent with the corrupt and badly run colonial- I always thought the whole industry of like digging for gold, it's sort of, it's very interesting, especially if you think of it in like compared to today's cryptocurrency. I don't know if this is a tangent that you guys are like, why is he, uh, this is just what's on my mind. I'm the reactor. So, hey, I'm going to say um, just like gold in and of itself they're digging for gold. They're doing all this work to mine something that is not. There's like no reason why it's valuable. It just is. People are willing to uh, pay a certain amount for gold because they know that other people are willing to pay it too or pay more. 
And um, so all this productivity is going into my, like all these people flooding there to find gold. And it's like, it's not actually productive. Okay. Elites ...and rose up in rebellion in the infamous Eureka. And, and I'm not trying to um, say cryptocurrencies, like anything bad about them. I, my point is actually to say people use that as like a way to say cryptocurrencies are bad. Well, if you think about it, that's kind of, uh, it's very similar to how gold is and was. A stockade. These settlers were beginning to feel a sense of nationalism that perhaps Australia could be something different. The winds of change were on Terra Australis, and soon large scale trade unions developed in Australia's largely working class population from the ideas of orthodox Marxists. Trade hmm. unions still hold a significant influence over Australian politics today. But let's not it's forget crazy. the rift that had been forming between Australia and Australians. The government and its people. Mm. Thousands of ex-convicts were being released each year, most of them turning to civil jobs, but a sizable minority turned to Australia's bushy frontier for freedom and profits. Policing was harsh, but order couldn't reach far enough. Outside of the cities, only personal gain and wealth could drive law enforcement. Money would change hands and lips were sealed. In this climate, an Australian icon was... It's like the Old West of, the, of Australia. Born, That's cool. Ned Kelly. Famous for his tin hat, Robin Hood thievery, infamous for his cop killing and town raids, and recognisable everywhere for that nifty bulletproof suit. For more on one of the most well-known cornerstones of Australian folklore, come to my channel, featured... Dude, I'm definitely going to look up a video on that guy. I don't know almost anything. I mean, I know the suit... Apart from that, that sounds fascinating. True. And check out my video on old Ned. Ned Kelly. Okay, so besides bulletproof suits or whatever, most- What an interesting time. Those people, even though it seems so savage, the way, like, you know, all the crime and these criminals being released and everybody's, you know, like, watching their back and they're paying each other off for- It just sounds really, um, cool. But also- it was probably kind of scary. Most Aussie colonies were granted self-governing status and united to form the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901, a dominion of the British Crown. The new Australian government was very quick to open up a new dark chapter in Aboriginal history, the infamous Stolen Generation. Beginning in 1905, the government began rounding up half-castes, a term which is now highly offensive, and mm. settled them into white families with the intention of breeding out their Aboriginal blood. If you don't get the reference, I highly recommend the film The Rabbit Proof Fence if you'd like to see a story inspired by true events. I definitely don't get the reference. There is so much history here that uh, it would be so interesting, I bet. Half casts. Blood in a form of cultural genocide. Abuses of these children were also rampant which is a rather depressing segue into the White Australia policy, a set of strict settlement acts which restricted immigration from anyone who wasn't British or wow. Northern European up until about the Second World War. Oh As a God. British colony, Australia would unilaterally declare war on Germany during the First World War, forming the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, or ANZACs. The young nation was sent headfirst into war. Around half a million soldiers volunteered, or nearly one-tenth of the total population. The baptism of fire came during the Gallipoli campaign, when more than 8,000 men lost their lives in the failed invasion of Turkey, an event etched into the memory of the Australian zeitgeist. Although crippled from the Great Depression, Australia again took up arms in 1939 to support her mother nation in the Second World War, this time fighting in Europe, North Africa, the Pacific mm. and South Asia. Prisoners of war in Malaya, Burma and Thailand were treated inhumanely by the Japanese, who also bombed Australia's northern coast about a hundred times. Oh wow, I didn't know that. <coughs> Sorry. That's amazing. I didn't know the Japanese and the Australian had that kind of history. Australia in World War II. Makes sense, I suppose. Australia is still a very young nation. times though, wow, a hundred times. Because they only bombed America once. So to think of a hundred times. But it has emerged a very powerful force in the region, now a beacon of democracy, social progressivism and commerce, with its phenomenal urbanization consistently ranked among the world's most livable cities. Walking the line between left and right with generous social programs, universal suffrage, a welcoming immigration policy and attractive business prospects. 
This is John. <laughs> John wants to learn how- Oh, you know, fun fact about this building here. If you put them all together, all those pieces, it forms a perfect sphere. <laughs> Every Australian video with like the cool facts that I watch has that in it. And I still don't understand. I'm going to keep saying that forever. I don't understand how you put that together and it makes a sphere. How to play the didgeridoo he bought from a garage sale. But this is John. John wants to learn how to play the didgeridoo he bought from a garage sale. But the lessons are expensive, so John will probably give up. But wait, John, you can learn for free over at Skillshare. Oh and just God, we're watching an ad. <laughs> and well done. Below. Hey, Load some of the, the video. artwork used in the videos. Okay, fascinating, as I knew it would be. And I really appreciate this to Sui Bin He. Yeah. Thank you for the video. Um, I'm definitely checking out this Ned Kelly video. That just sounds so interesting. Um, clearly, there's way more history to Australia than I ever knew. And to be fair, I knew there was. It's not like I thought there wasn't. It's just... I don't, I'm very ignorant about Australia's history, so that's really interesting to learn their, their kind of place in World War II and how the Japanese attacked them over a hundred times, and you had that, like, old West period where you, all the outlaws are, it's very similar to the Wild West in America. Very cool stuff. I enjoyed that. Um, I might have to watch this 43-minute video. Uh, let me know if you guys would fall asleep during that, if I was to react to that. Um, but I think it would be super interesting. But anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for staying this long into the video. That's amazing. I appreciate it. And uh, hey, if you liked it, you can hit the thumbs up or you don't have to. Doesn't really matter to me. Well, it sort of does, but it's your life. Thank you. I just appreciate you watching. So have a good Arvo and goodbye.